Municipal Diocese of Southern Ohio. Uh, ninth Bishop? Yes. The Ninth Bishop of our Diocese. And uh, he's a writer of note, but I was also delighted to hear. Uh, he did have an idea for a Sabbath uh, sabbatical coming up. Uh, and from what I understand, you changed your mind and are going into the area of poetry, correct? Yeah. So he's a poet, and are you going to be writing or studying? Or? Uh, well, trying to write. Okay. So uh, it's wonderful when your bishop is also a poet. Uh, beside our bishop is Nancy Hopkins Green, known to many of you here at Redeemer, as one of the assisting priests in our congregation. Uh, her focus is on mission, but she does many, many things around uh, this congregation. Uh, she's also an editor and a writer at Ford Movement Publications, which is uh, located in Cincinnati, but it's a ministry of the National Episcopal Church. And thank you for being with us, my colleague. And then Janet Reese and Chris have been here earlier. Uh, Janet Reese, as you know, is a friend of the parish, uh, has worked as an author and an, an editor and a publisher <clears throat> Excuse me. For Publishers Weekly, Westminster John Knox Press, Patheos Press, uh, her flunking sainthood book was uh, named one of the uh, ten best religion books of the year in 2011. Uh, and uh, she's an expert in not only understanding Sabbath but in practicing Sabbath, uh, as she told us in that book. <laughs> <laughs> And last but not least is, is Christopher Smith, who was our first speaker at the beginning of the Latin Spirit uh, series as a member of the Englewood Christian Church on the near east side of Indianapolis. Uh, he is the founding editor of the Englewood Review of Books uh, and the author of five, uh, but he's currently finalizing um, uh, the text of a new book with the very intriguing title, title of Slow Church uh, that he's co-writing with John Patterson. Uh, he, Jana, uh, are also very significant bloggers. Um, please welcome our four guests tonight. <laughs> and this will be very unstructured. We're just going to start by having Bishop Tom Bridenthal just speak to us um, about Sabbath. Thank you very much. I'm not a poet. That's what's scary about this sabbatical that's coming up. Think of myself that way many, many, many years ago. Um, so, but sabbatical actually comes from the word for Sabbath, Shabbat. So, um, I'm hoping that I will have a time of rest, which it becomes a time of encounter, which I suppose is part of what I want to talk about this evening a little bit. And I'm very, very uh, honored to be part of this distinguished company. Can you hear me better yes. now? Now we can. Yes. Can you hear anything I said before? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, you all know that Sabbath or Shabbat is Saturday, right? Not Sunday. It's, it's uh, the Jewish Sabbath begins on Friday evening and goes until uh, nightfall on Saturday evening. And that's important, I think, for us as Christians to keep in mind because uh, it is a it's very confusing when we refer to Sunday as the Sabbath. Since for early Christians from the very beginning, the whole point of Sunday was that it was, um, it was a reminder of Easter, and it mattered that it fell on the first day of the week, not the seventh day of the week. The idea was that just as God began creating the world on the first day and rested on the seventh, so, on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, a new creation began, a whole new cycle of creation, which was the redemption uh, and fruition of God's original creation. So, for Christians, it's really important that Sunday is not the Sabbath. It's not in any way a denial of the profound sanctity and importance of Shabbat. But Sunday has its own meaning as first day, or as I'll say later, perhaps eighth day. And that really links up with the, uh, the ancient Christian understanding of what we're doing when we worship on Sunday. Sabbath is about rest, but what we do when we worship on Sunday we call liturgy, 
which means literally the work of the people, not rest, but work. Beat urgea. Urgos means work. Ergo means work, and the word lead is related to, we get our word laity from that, the, the whole laos of God, the people of God. So we think of work, we may not think of it that way, but our, our Christian forebears definitely thought of Sunday worship as a work, a thing that we do, an action. And if you look at the whole structure of the Eucharist, which was which emerged very early in Christian history. It is all about action. It is the action of the proclamation of the gospel. It is the action of our exchange of Christ's peace with one another. The claim that we are actually bearers of Christ's shalom and that we can actually bestow it upon one another. The action of the prayers of the people. Uh, and the reason why we stand for the prayers of the people is because it is an act of the whole people as a priesthood of God. We stand in, a, in the priestly stance. If we were ancient Christians, we would be waving our arms, we would have our arms up when we prayed, when we, because we are joining Jesus, our great high priest, in his eternal work of intercession, offering the world to God, offering the world that he claims as his own because he died and rose for it. So the prayers of the people are, they are action, and, and very strongly so. And then of course there's the action of the offering of our gifts of bread and wine and money and whatever, our internal action of bringing before God everything that we are, the good and the bad, in the expectation and faith that as it is offered in Christ's name, in union with, with his own self-giving, it will be returned to us holy, so that we not only receive the body of Christ as something external to us that we take in, but we receive ourselves back as a community sanctified to be the body of Christ in the world. So it's all about action, it's not about rest. There's no rest in the Eucharist. So. Are we a Sabbath people or not? What's the, what is the place of Sabbath in, in the Christian imagination? I was, I was uh, playing around with this idea actually last week as I was preparing a sermon for last Sunday. We were at church on Sunday. You know that we heard from John's Gospel about how Jesus uh, comes and has dinner with Lazarus and Mary and Martha um, on the night before the um, before Palm Sunday, and uh, and how Mary brings out the costly nard perfume and bathes his feet with them and washes his feet with her hair, and Judas gets mad about that and, and so on it goes. But John, I was fascinated by that. It had never really, really struck me that John is very very clear about what day of the week we're talking about. He says, six days before the Passover. And since in John's chronology, the Passover happens on the Sabbath, on Saturday, and Jesus dies on the day of preparation when all the lambs are being slaughtered for the Passover feast, that means if you count backwards, this dinner that Jesus is having with Lazarus and Mary and Martha comes on Saturday evening. So it's the end, it comes at the end of the Sabbath. There's a, the Jewish name for that is Havdalah. And it's the ceremony of the escorting of the, of the Sabbath out of the house and giving thanks for the Sabbath, uh, smelling sweet spices as a reminder of the sweetness of the Sabbath, which I think is related to what Mary is up to when she brings out the nard, and the singing of a hymn to Elijah, the prophet, uh, who will, who's coming, Will, uh, will portend the arrival of the Messiah and the Messianic age that is the eternal Sabbath when every day of the week will be Sabbath. So what Mary is doing is identifying Jesus as the Messiah and recognizing in him the inauguration, the dawning of a Sabbath which is not over but is going to go on forever. And that it seems to me uh, is, is the theme that pervades the New Testament. If we're thinking of 
about the New Testament through the lens of Sabbath. Jesus is bringing in the eternal Sabbath, the Sabbath rest which will never, will never end. For instance, in the, in the letter to the Hebrews, um, the author to the Hebrews quotes extensively from Psalm 95, uh, which concludes by saying, um, Harden not your hearts as your forebears did in the wilderness at Meribah and on that day at Massa when they tempted me. They put me to the test, though they had known my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they would never enter into my rest. And the author of Hebrews says, well, let's not be like them. <laughs> but he goes on to say something a little bit more hopeful. And he says, if God is saying they shall not enter into my rest, then he can't just be talking about the rest that he enjoyed on the seventh day after he created the world. He must be talking about something in the future, a rest that awaits, awaits us. And so the author to the Hebrews spends a lot of time exhorting us to enter into that rest as boldly as we can. And uh, I don't have time to go into the, the richness of the ways in which this theme is, is turned and looked at in so many different ways in Hebrews. But it has to do with us both being willing to go to the place of crucifixion, the place of dereliction, the place outside the gate where Jesus died, and to be also to realize that that place also at the same time is the place of assembly, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city to which we have all, at which we have already arrived. So that the, the rest which we find in Jesus uh, is something which is already ours today. The author of Hebrews keeps saying it's today, today. Today is our Sabbath, right now. And it, 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 is a, it is a Sabbath which has an eternal Sabbath that has been won for us through the, the blood of Jesus, which speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel Abel's blood cursed, cursed Cain, who murdered him. But Jesus' blood, uh, it is implied, speaks a word not of cursing, but of reconciliation. So the rest that we find in Jesus, whether we find it in identification with his suffering, or in identification with the, the assembly of all the holy ones who have accepted faith on his, accepted salvation on his terms, that's, that, that, that rest is essentially the peace that comes through reconciliation and which we are called in turn to be, uh, or to be ministers of. So that's, that's one way in which we can understand Sabbath within the Christian framework, that when we are doing the work of being the people of God, and it is hard work, when we are doing the work of, of forbearing with one another, and forgiving one another, and putting up with one another, and holding each other accountable, and walking with one another, and being willing to spend eternity with one another, that work lands us in Sabbath rest here and now. Let me just, I've already gone too long, on too long, but let me just, just to tell you about a passage in the Gospel which I think helps us understand uh, this tension between work and Sabbath rest, which I think lies at the heart of Christian thinking about um, following Jesus, being with Jesus, uh, in communion with Jesus, worshiping uh, the Father in the Holy Spirit every Sunday morning, every eighth day, every every anticipation of the eternal Sabbath. And that passage that I have in mind is, is from the chap chapter four of Mark's Gospel, and there are parallels in, in Matthew and Luke as well. And it's when, it's one of those many times when Jesus is crossing the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, and there's always a storm or some problem. <laughs> and this time there's a really big storm, and the, the disciples are afraid that they are going, their boat will, be, boat will sink. Jesus is asleep on a pillow in the boat, fast asleep. And they wake him up and get up, get up, don't you care that we're dying, we're drowning? And he says, oh, he tells them, be silent until everything becomes calm. And then he says to them, you know, why don't you have any faith at all? 
it's a really a striking image. I cannot think of any icon of Jesus asleep. And yet, surely we have here a profound image of Christ's relationship to the church. The church as a, a, a band uh, of people out, you know, really out on a limb, out in a storm, afraid of dying, afraid of being overturned. And Jesus among, among us, asleep, completely at rest in our, in, in, among us, uh, taking his repose among us. What that means is that, um, I think among other things, is that in us, Jesus sees the culmination and the fruit of his work. We are his Sabbath rest. Because as messed up as we are, our struggle to live lives of faith and reconciliation, our struggle to enter boldly into the rest that Jesus has prepared for us, is in fact Jesus' rest. It is the culmination of Jesus' work. We are his work. And therefore, we are the beginning of his eighth day. Let's stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Sabbath um, at all is a challenge for us. 
And again, I'm feeling like I'm just picking up, I'm not even picking up on what, what Bishop Breidenfeld said, but I'll throw out what I want to throw out. There's one thing that is, there's, there's one thing that, that has um, probably struck me more than anything anybody else, anyone has said. On uh, February 17th, we had a guest uh, preacher here, Matthew Sleeth, who um, has written a book called 24-6, and he's a, um, he's, he preached with us, although he is not, um, he's not an ordained minister. He's an emergency room doctor who's devoted his life to issues of faith in the environment. But it was not in his, anything he said in the presentation or the sermon, but in, um, in a casual conversation afterwards that she said um, something to the effect of she and her husband are recent converts to Christianity. Uh, recent as in 10 years ago, it's been in their adulthood. And she said that they came to faith through observing the Sabbath, not that they observed the Sabbath when they came to faith. And to me, that is one of the most powerful things and such a challenge to us as we go forward to this is can we really trust enough to do it? Can we trust enough to start um, towards, and I think it's a little bit like tithing, I think you need to do it to be converted to it. And we talk about the gradual tithe. I think we're going to do the gradual Sabbath. <laughs> um, and, and I think that if we can do small things in our lives to carve out time. We have talked about um, everything from uh, how do we do it? What's the role of technology? Do we need a stop day or do we need Sabbath moments? Matthew Sleep is big on stop day. Um, my personal, what I finally come to, to think about that is yes and yes, we need Sabbath, a stop day in order to realize how desperately we need stop times in the rest of our lives. Um, is Sabbath, Sabbath about togetherness or solitude? Um, we gather to do the work of the church and that's togetherness and some people what they need more than anything else is to get away from everybody else. And how do we balance both of those for, for, um, for Sabbath? Uh, does Sabbath observance restore the rules? Um, we, that's kind of come up off and on in, in various ways. Is we don't want to become yet another people that put up rules on what we're supposed to do because then we start living under the law. Um, what if you're retired? What about the fact that different personality, Janda pointed this out, that Sabbath activities are different for different personalities? And um, different members of the family can have a very different idea of what is not work <laughs> and what is rest. And, um, and then by the same token, in families, clergy families like ours, is what happens when you can when Sunday is definitely work day for us. It's not debatable for, I mean, it might be debatable for other people, or maybe they can carve it out for other things, but it's a work day. And how do we then have a Sabbath when our family is on a different schedule and so on? Um, my daughter would love me to tell her one day we don't do homework, and <laughs> this will stuck <laughs> along with that, or truancy in general, because of a thing we include not going. But I just, I want to read, um, I want to throw some stuff out, and then and I think that will be enough. This is a quote by Wayne Muller, who on his book on Sabbath. He said, he wrote, our willingness to rest depends on what we believe we will find there. At rest, we come face to face with the essence of life. If we believe life is fundamentally good, we will seek out rest as a taste of that goodness. If we believe life is fundamentally bad or flawed, we will be reluctant to quiet ourselves, afraid of meeting the darkness that resides in things or in ourselves. I thought that was a very powerful statement about, and it brings us to the question of, what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of that we don't, we can't trust that the world will keep spinning, that God the Creator will keep creating um, as God does, that the salvation of ourselves mostly, but the world does not depend on us keeping at it 24-7. That's one piece, another piece for me and I guess, I mean, when I was up, when I did my presentation um, on Sunday, I felt I almost, it really wasn't meant to be funny, but I, it, by the end I felt like I was some sort of a stand-up comedian because I was really talking about the reality of life and where 
everything sets in, everything from, you know, my head, me becoming resentful because my husband's taking Sabbath while I'm doing the laundry or putting the garbage out, you know, and, and all the dynamics of how we, we start and stop our way through this. But it's really serious. I think this is, I've come to believe this is, this could be the hinge point of, of our salvation, not whether we go to heaven, but the world. And one of the points that Walter made was if we don't, if we don't step aside, if we don't set that time apart, um, that is the place where we imagine, it, imagine alternatives. It's where we imagine possibilities. Where we imagine possibilities for our individual lives and for the world. And if we look at everything from partisan politics in the United States to the environmental crisis to anything, we need that time to set, to reflect, is what he kept saying, to reflect, to imagine possibilities, or else, or else. So I guess that's one piece that I've, I found myself increasingly challenged with and I haven't really thought of before. And again, um, he talks about it in terms of empire and the need for us to resist the forces of Egypt and the brick making and the, um, the ethos of our society, but could it be that this is a huge, huge, huge thing that we need to set a time rest? Another thing is just how idolatrous it is. And again, I, I say this as, as, a, um, as a Sabbath breaker, <laughs> that we begin to think that, that, that we need to keep at it longer than God did. God created the universe in six days. And, um, and I mean, however we whatever we believe that to mean, or however we take it. For us to think that we can't, that was God, but this is us, and we need to do it. We are simply saying that we are God, and that we, the God, that, um, we are playing God <coughs> in this idolatry. And finally, I guess, it's also that time apart is a place where we create space for grace, and again, if the minute we get on the treadmill of thinking we need to do all these things, and it, again, it's, it's a lot of really, really, really good things that we do in our lives. But if we can't step out aside from them, um, we are saying that somehow Jesus needs us, or somehow we earn our own salvation, or we need to do it. And it's a complete failure to trust. And so I guess, um, I guess I've come to re realize how fundamental this is. I knew it made life better. And I knew that I had times in my life when I've observed the Sabbath and times when I hadn't. And I was, um, one thing Matthew Slee said was it makes you more productive when you're, when you're working, if you take time off of work. And I think it's very powerful and I think it's one of God's biggest gifts to us. And I hope, I hope it won't be another one of God's gifts to us that we don't receive gratefully and um, joyously and um, take the invitation um, to, to receive it. I think that's enough for me. I want to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I should qualify in a massive way what Charlie said, which is that um, I'm not an expert on the Sabbath or keeping the Sabbath. I'm still learning, but it's an enjoyable process to learn. So. So there, Charlie, take that. Um, I think that I've been reflecting on a couple of different things as we've gone through this in the last five or six weeks. The first is the first thing is that I um, I think I originally started coming to a practice of the Sabbath because I was very tired and you know it was when my daughter was a baby and suddenly I had no sleep at all. The Sabbath suddenly seemed very attractive for that reason. <laughs> but it was also a bit of a rebellion against the legalism of my church. You know, I'm a Latter-day Saint, a uh, groupie of the parish. That's my official title. Um, and in my church, people talk about the Sabbath a lot. This is one of the, the great, wonderful gifts of being Mormon, is that we take spiritual practices like tithing very seriously. The problem with that is that the tendency toward legalism is very strong. And so when I became a Mormon, I felt like people were talking about this interesting thing called the Sabbath, but I didn't like the conversation that they were having, which was, 
do this, don't do this, and mostly the don'ts, focusing on what was not appropriate for the Sabbath. But, like you said, it was in the jumping in and just trying it and experimenting with it that I became aware of just how powerful the Sabbath can be. If you leave behind the legalism and, and to some extent stop listening to other people about what works for them as some, somehow definitive, what should be normative for everyone, and listen to what God is trying to tell you in that space that you've created on the Sabbath, then it can be life-changing. I think that's what I have learned. Um, I wanted to read a short passage from this book by Dan Allender on the Sabbath. It's from a section called Deliver Us On to Delight, which probably tells you a little bit about his approach. The Sabbath comes to an end. Time passes from a day of delight to six days of labor. And it is labor. We suffer the birth agony of hope and despair, the rise of light and the descent of darkness. The night masks the unfinished demands of the day. We surrender to sleep and await the dawn's potential to achieve our dreams. And that day ends, for better or worse. Yet our desire for what we were most meant to know, delight and glory increases as the week comes to our next Sabbath. Every human being is in some kind of weekly war. I thought that was a very strong image, a weekly war. We strive, fight, retreat, negotiate, and surrender. We crave rest, we thirst for joy. Even those who know the pleasure of Sabbath are seduced to forget the oasis of play that awaits those who give their hearts to Sabbath. This image of the oasis of play, I think is where I want to continue exploring. And I don't play enough in life, and that's, that's a problem. I, been a little too serious and tend toward workaholism a bit too much. Phil is smiling. Yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of God taking delay in creation and then taking that and applying it to how we might delight in the abundance of life, that is what Sabbath has come to be about for me. And then the last thing that I would say without weeping is that Sabbath has changed a lot for me since my mother died two months ago. And somebody made a comment here the, um, when I was speaking that the temptation of not wanting to quiet ourselves because we are so afraid of what will come out when we do, when we settle and when we, when we take the time to really listen for the voice of God, that can be a terrifying thing. And as I I'm trying to negotiate this, this life without my mother. Um, don't be nice to me. <laughs> it makes it so much worse. <laughs> you pastors, it's just in the DNA. Thank you, thank you. But then I'll just start to cry and it'll be a mess. But that sense of settling down and coming face to face with whatever loss or sadness we're experiencing and there are so many of them but i feel like it's a holy work that i'm doing right now and it's hard it's sad but to take that time is very important thank you Jen. i really appreciate you sharing that uh, I think I would echo what Jana said, that I am no expert at this. Uh, some of you heard me say uh, when I was here at the beginning of Flint uh, that part of the reason that I've been reflecting on Slow Church for several years now is that it doesn't come naturally to me, um, that my inclination is to be a sort of person that moves quickly and gets things done, accomplishes things, and um, and, and I realized that there's a lot about that that's not healthy for me, for my family, for my church, for all creation. Um, so, so the Sabbath, um, as part of what we talk about when we talk about slow church, uh, doesn't come easy or naturally for me. 
Um, but I want to talk kind of in the vein of uh, some of the things that we've heard already. Um, just go a little bit, um, just and throw in a couple more thoughts um, related to this idea that uh, Nancy proposed for us of how, how Sabbath becomes our salvation or leads us in the way of salvation. I love the language in the passage of Janet of, of delight. Um, I just kind of want to move in that direction as well. But I want to start from a place that is very similar to what the bishop uh, talked about. Um, I really appreciated what he said about the life of Christ being a life of liturgy, of the work of the people. Um, kind of as I was putting my thoughts together for this, um, I had been using the language of engagement, um, but by that I meant uh, basically <laughs> uh, a life of, of liturgy, the work of the people. Um, the, the Christian life is a life of engagement. Uh, we follow in the way of Christ, uh, who is and was called Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, God, God is a God of engagement. He's not the God of the deists um, of several centuries ago, though that is just kind of up there somewhere um, and aloof and al aloft. But, but God is actively engaged in creation. The incarnation of Jesus is, is the embodiment of God's desire to be engaged uh, with, with humanity and with all creation. And we have desires in us to, to be engaged. Uh, and I mean, these are always stirring up. I mean, we see, uh, I mean, obviously these are extreme examples, but um, we see the earthquake in Haiti several years ago, or we see images from there, or images of people grieving um, after the shootings in Newtown more recently. Uh, and the desires are stirring up in us. We want to do something. We want to be engaged. Um, we know that these things that happen are right, um, and we want to be engaged. We want to act. Um, but I, and I think that that desire is, is healthy, but, but not all the ways that we choose to act are healthy. Um, there is healthy engagement and there's not healthy engagement. And some, so sometimes the ways that we act are, are ways that kind of keep, keep people at arm's length. Um, we, uh, we, we give money or we give somebody a meal or a couple dollars to someone on the street that's asking for money and kind of send them on their way um, without wanting to be engaged with them, um, to meet them, to know them, um, to see God in that person. Um, and certainly the media culture of our times contributes to this. I mean, it stirs up desires in us um, for which oftentimes we are powerless to act, particularly when it's on, uh, of a situation on the other side of the world. Um, so we have, we have all these desires, and we want to act, and we should act. I mean, we're called into engagement, but how, how do we learn healthy engagement? And I would maintain that Sabbath practice is one of the primary ways in which we learn how to engage healthily in the world. I and mean, we've heard some of this already um, in what Nancy was saying, that, um, that Sabbath is a place to reflect. And in the, in the space of reflecting, um, reflecting on situations, reflecting on grief, um, uh, that we learn how to to live within that, um, with, live within uh, the life that we've been given. Sabbath teaches us to set aside our will to do, and and just to learn to be, to be present, to be present with ourselves, to be present with our families, to be present with our church communities. And our neighbors as well, and and it, it, Sabbath, the Sabbath practice of stopping and um, and taking this time to be and to to listen to others to the to the desires that we have inside of us and, and how those are driving us um, is a really important. Um, it's a really important practice. I want to read uh, two little things, if you will indulge me. Um, the, I've been rereading here a um, wonderful book, a classic book, uh, Henry Nowlin's uh, and uh, Donald McNeil and Douglas Morrison's uh, book, Compassion. 
Um, I've actually come to realize, I've read this book probably half a dozen times over the last 15 years or so, but I hadn't read it for probably five or 10 years. Um, there was a period there where I read it quite a lot, but, um, but I come to realize that really what the authors are talking about is really a sort of spirituality that really undergirds what we are calling Soul Church. Um, so if you're really interested in knowing uh, more about Soul Church before the book, our book actually comes out, um, I really would encourage you to take a look at this. Um, there's really a lot of, um, uh, of synergy, and, I, and I'm sure that I was influenced by them, but it kind of uh, just sat on the shelf there for a while. But, but in picking it up again, um, it's, there's many wonderful things here, but, um, but one of the things that they talk about, and they don't use the language of Sabbath, they don't talk about Sabbath, but they talk about patience. And I think that patience is this quality in us that is, this, that is um, built up, that is edified um, as we continue to practice Sabbath. And I thought this, this, this image of patience that they provide, um, and particularly in relation to what I've already introduced as engagement, they say, um, patience as an active entering into the thick of life opens us to a new experience of time. Patience makes us realize that the Christian who has entered into discipleship, discipleship with Jesus Christ lives not only with a new mind, but also in a new time. The discipline of patience is the concentrated effort to let the new time into which we are led by Christ determine our perceptions and decisions. It is this new time that offers the opportunity and the context to be together in a compassionate way. In order to explore more fully this distinction between old and new time, to gain a deeper appreciation oops, for the importance of the discipline of patience, let us look at our impatient moments. Impatience always has something to do with time. When we are on, when we are impatient with speakers, we want them to stop speaking or to move on to another subject. When we are impatient with children, we want them to stop crying, asking for ice cream, or running around. When we are impatient with ourselves, we want to change our bad habits, finish a set task, or move ahead faster. Whatever the nature of our impatience, we want to leave the physical or mental state in which we find ourselves and move to another less uncomfortable place. When we express our impatience, we reveal our desire that things will change as soon as possible. I wish he would show up soon. I've already been waiting here for an hour and the train still has not arrived. There's no end to his sermon. How many times have we said that? <laughs> How much longer before we get there? These expressions betray an inner restlessness that often shows itself in feet tapping under the table, feet, fingers nervously intertwined, or long, drawn out yawning. Essentially, impatience is experiencing the moment as empty, useless, meaningless. It is wanting to escape from here and now as soon as possible. And I mean, I think that Sabbath practice, I mean, in teaching us rest, as we've already talked about, I mean, teaches us to be patient, teaches us to learn what to do with those restless moments that we all have. And I just wanted to, in closing, read one more thing. Um, and this is from uh, one of my favorite writers um, that you may or may not be familiar with. He's actually an art critic. Um, uh, and what wrote, wrote a wonderful book um, a few years ago called God in the Gallery, um, Modern Art and the Practice of the Church or something like that. I know it has modern art and sometimes I can't remember, but his name is Daniel Sinell. Um, and he wrote a wonderful review uh, recently for Books and Culture magazine about the work of Spanish painter, Spanish realist painter, um, Antonio Lopez Garcia. Um, and it's just, it's just a, a strikingly, I mean, you might not think of a book review as a, a really well-crafted, beautiful um, piece of writing. But, uh, but it brought me to tears the first time I read it, but I'd like to read just a little snippet of that, because I, I think it's relevant to what Sabbath does in us. Um, I'll see if I can read it without crying myself here. 
<laughs> All right, we'll see. Um, but again, you'll see the the sorts of the sorts of themes of engagement um, and rest here. Sadell writes, a painter does not paint what he knows, but paints in order to know, to discover something about himself and the world. For Lopez Garcia, the process of painting is a struggle, a knock-down, drag-out brawl with the world, which refuses to yield its secrets or give a blessing too easily. He is notorious for working meth methodically and meticulously which has limited his production and consequently the opportunities he has to show his work, averaging only about two solo ex exhibitions per decade, which is barely any of them, in, in an art world in which artists generate multiple exhibitions each year and whose studios resemble factories, it is refreshing that he approaches the production of each artifact, whether a painting or a sculpture, with almost sacramental focus and care. For most of us, and this is really the heart of it, for most of us, the world is no longer a cause of fascination, of sustained contemplation and reflection. A bird is just a bird, a vase of flowers is just that, and the grace of this man or the charm of that woman is buried beneath a multitude of judgments we make about them as they pass us. This is the, quote, real world, the world which Cervantes writes, an inn is just an inn. But Lopez Garcia paints the inn as if it were a castle, invest investing such prosaic, overlooked, and insignificant subjects as a bowl of fruit, dirty laundry soaking in a pan, a bathroom, a skinned rabbit, a refrigerator, a woman in a bathtub with a dignity that is quite frankly disturbing. Lopez Garcia makes paintings that are the result of his struggle with objects and experiences we rarely ever notice, much less take seriously as worth our visual recognition and contemplation. One of the more remarkable and stubbornly beautiful and seductive objects in the world for Lopez Garcia is the quince tree in his backyard. For decades, he has tried to paint this simple tree as it absorbs and refracts the sunlight. In 1992, Filmmaker Victor Erice was given unique access to the artist's world to make the award-winning documentary, The Quince Tree of the Sun. The film tells the story of Lopez Garcia's approach to art through his relationship with this little tree, which he feels the urge to paint every autumn, and yet every autumn it thwarts his attempt to capture his experience of it. To watch the artist around this tree offers a rare and revealing insight into the mystery of artistic practice of smearing paint on a canvas and the naive yet powerful sophistication of a man fascinated with creation. And I mean, I think that's, that's what Sabbath does to us. I mean, it teaches us to be present and to see the wonder and the fascination that is in the everyday world and the everyday people that, that surround us. I think that's where I will stop for now. That's amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. Before the <laughs> we have obviously not exhausted the topic. Uh, thank you so much for those wonderful insights and for sharing with us. Um, what I would see happening now, if okay, with the panelists and all of you, is simply to have uh, an ongoing conversation here. If, if you guys want to add more ideas, please feel free. Uh, all here present, if you want to share some thoughts or questions, uh, direct them to any panelists in particular or to all of them. Uh, so why don't we just open it up in that way. I'll try to get a microphone around and kind of help. Um, I am very taken with this would-be icon of the sleeping Jesus and um, the idea that Jesus' rest is um, in us, and I, I feel like we may be missing something in our tradition that that, that isn't an image, and um, 
we don't really know how to practice this idea or the idea that all shall be well, all is well, and we always want to fix things. And I, I guess I'm obviously directing this to the bishop. Is, is there something that we've lost or somewhere where, where we can turn in our tradition um, or in our understanding to um, fully appreciate this idea? One of the most beautiful but unnoticed liturgies in our prayer book is the liturgy for Holy Saturday. Um, it's very short, but, but it's simply uh, um, a kind of resting in with Jesus in the tomb. I used to love to to celebrate that liturgy with the altar guild on you know, Saturday morning before Easter, as they, they, were, they were busy preparing the church for Easter just to stop and think about Jesus in the tomb. And oddly enough, the, uh, the icon of the resurrection in Eastern Orthodoxy is in fact what Jesus is up to while he's resting in the tomb. And that's the air of a new hell. And you see images of Jesus with both hands just dragging Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah and Eric out of, out of the land of death into life. Um, so there's a tension <laughs> even there but I think uh, I think that the it's, it's too bad that the the one real Sabbath day in our liturgical calendar, which is Holy Saturday, is pretty much ignored by us. so anxious and that there's so much anxiety and that there's this 
push of classes um, to perform, 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 um, and what that means to them. And, 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 how, and he was literally asking the question, how do, how do we break this cycle? And so this, our, our Linton series on Sabbath was, was coming to mind that this is the space where we, we, we have to rebel, be very countercultural, and say that you don't have to always perform. You, you need to take a break. You need to slow down. You need to um, get away from the anxiety. Because we, we almost act as though that's just part of growing up is becoming more anxious. And part of your development is just to get used to it and get used to two hours of sleep and waking up in the night and this rolling in your head and stuff like that. And, and you should just deal with it as opposed to that's not healthy at all and we need to take a cultural pause. So, which is fascinating. I had a 21 year old though who was really experiencing this lack of Sabbath in his life. I think of Lent as a Sabbath period. I was a Catholic as a child so Lent was a time of, of grim um, avoidance of things. And then I found the Episcopal Church, and Lent was a time when you could get nourished as opposed to not eating certain things. And um, I didn't make any plans for this Lent. I was just going to keep working every time I wasn't asleep and um, do the thing I always do. But then um, Cindy invited me to come to this series, and I found that each Wednesday that I came here, there was a wonderful um, letting go that made room for two strange things that I don't usually experience. Uh, one was a sense of um, childlike anticipation and um, humility, like there were things that were going to happen and I didn't know what they would be. And the other was um, a, a sense of trust that was reinforced each week because each week that I came, not knowing what was going to happen, something wonderful happened each week and it just reinforced my expectation that a wonderful thing would happen seven days later. And um, this combination of humility and not being the boss of it, but, but being the recipient of something um, wonderful that just made me anticipate the next week with, with more trust and more joy has been a real gift of this series to a non parishioner here who is glad that you opened your doors and made this happen. That is wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Chris, I was really taken by uh, your use of the word patience. Um, I think that's a beautiful word to describe the state of mind or the state of heart that one uh, moves into in order to experience Sabbath. Uh, it ties so beautifully with what Nancy said about the idea of uh, the world will spin without you. Um, and so it's okay uh, to step back from that. And it's in the stepping back from that that, that these that possibilities and, and, and opportunities will come to bear that will not when you're in a 24-7 tube. Because when you're in a 24-7 tube, you're going down that highway as fast as you can, and you can't think of the alternatives or the options. And I find myself caught up in that way a lot. It's, it's, it's only, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to kind of stumble into some patient time um, that I can begin to experience that. But, it reminds me of, of the wise way in which Richard Rohr um, described his center out in Albuquerque. He calls it the center of action and contemplation, which sounds like almost two completely different things, but what he is arguing for, I think, is a balanced life where we, where we are people who do, but we're people who be. Uh, and, and we would, and, and it's to our peril if we don't do either. I do remember, uh, I think it was Walter was, was responding to a question like that. Not in our culture, uh, our default mode is to do. And so, you know, when we err, we tend to almost always err inside of just going full bore in that too. Um, 
But patience is a, is a simple concept that I can wrap my mind around. Thanks for bringing that. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was really, it was really providential, I guess I could say, that I stumbled back into this, this passage in this book that's largely about uh, patient and compassion. Uh, now and the other authors of the book emphasize that the Latin root, uh, pati, is, is at the root of both patience and compassion. Um, and that there's a deep, deep connection between those two. Because one of the, that I, I say that it was providential or fortuitous, however, um, that I kind of stumbled into this chapter because one of the most difficult chapters that I'm still kind of wrestling with in the Slow Church book is the chapter on patience. Um, and, and it really, it was really difficult to really put words around what patience is. Um, because I knew it wasn't, I mean, just the simply kind of waiting for things. Um, but but the this, this, this sort of way that they described it that I read here it was just really helpful of, of learning to deal with that, that restlessness and that anxiety um, that, that is inside of us and that, that cultural and uh, unhealthy uh, push to, to, to always do. I mean, again, it's, it is a sort of balance. Um, and, and that's one of the things I've been working through with the Slow Church, church blog recently. I mean, again, some of the pushback we get a little bit with the idea of slow church is, well, are you just advocating passivity? And what does slow church mean for the people on the margins? And, um, and I, mean, I think those are really good in the questions. And I mean, I think some of the language of Sabbath and of thinking of engagement or liturgy and the importance of us, of our call to to follow in the way of Christ, Emmanuel, uh, in that sort of engagement, um, that liturgical work, um, is, is really important. But to be able to infuse that with Sabbath of, of reflecting and stepping back and realizing that it's ultimately, uh, ultimately God who is reconciling, it's God's work of reconciliation that was, was begun or was completed in Christ, but is still coming to fruition. Chris, um, I'm <clears throat> not quite sure I know how to put this, but your use of the term engagement uh, strikes me or struck me, and I get, rightly or wrongly, I get the impression that engagement to be true engagement needs depth. And I guess I find myself taking exception to that in some cases that, for example, the, the individual on the street that as you're passing by, um, they have a sign up for homeless. And this happens so often at um, stop signs. Um, if you respond to the request, at that moment it's not possible to engage with that person. But I suggest that the engagement can take place afterwards if you happen to say a short prayer for that person. Sure, I mean, I think that that's reasonable. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that uh, that encounters like that can be navigated. But, but again, I appreciate, uh, appreciate your, your comment um, because, I mean, I think that, that we can't always have like the deepest and most intimate encounters with everyone that we meet. And there's, I mean, part of the engagement is simply a constant discernment of, of how, do we, how do we meet God in this present moment? Um, and, and, and that's going to look different uh, with different people in different situations, I believe. Um, and I mean, that's just the nature of, of, of life. And I mean, the, I mean, some of the things that I read about uh, Lopez Garcia and uh, just all the the wonderful things that God has for us uh, in in every moment and every encounter and to learn to be attentive and to be present to those things as they come along is is, or is for me at least uh, fundamentally a part of what Sabbath is.
I have a question for you, Bishop Renthal. <laughs> uh, and uh, I felt like such a lightweight talking after you because <laughs> all was, I mean, it's so deep and so so profound. And um, and I um, on our Sunday morning pieces that Charlie and Bruce and I did, we kind of began by sharing our own experience of Sabbath and how we've wrestled with it in our lives and, and how we and my um, case broken the Sabbath more than not, but had those slight tastes of it that made me realize, yeah, now I get it. You know, those moments of being in the art gallery or in the, you know, the fully present moment. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit of your own experience of trying to, and, and again, I'm, I'm taking us into a, a definition of Sabbath. Um, in many ways, I think, I think we're, we're getting, when, when um, Chris was speaking, I think that he's, he's both with patience and engagement, to me it's contemplation is my word. And um, I've told people that my most contemplative moments in my life is watching my 17-year-old daughter play basketball and they kind of give me this screwy look like, that's her prayer life. But I <laughs> define it as, as the most present I am to anything in my life. And I'm just wondering if you have any experience, wisdom, challenges, questions, whatever, out of your own experience of however you embrace um, what we're calling, we're kind of using as Sabbath, but you know, for lack of a better word. Uh, I told one of the staff, staff members today that I was coming here to talk about Sabbath, and she just laughed at me. <laughs> really, I'm terrible, I'm terrible at stopping working. I am, uh, and it's been much worse since I became a bishop. Uh, and that's that's about me. It's not about being a bishop. I think it's uh, it's it's about anxiety and and challenge and finding the, the easiest way to sort of gain a, a spurious sense of control. That's by working. So uh, I'm I'm one of the reasons why I I want to just what I was going to do for my sabbatical was um, go and study fresh expressions in England. And which is what I'm obsessed with here. And my wife said to me, do you realize what you're doing? I mean, you're just going to go and continue working even harder, and you're not going to get away from anything, and you'll be of no use to anybody when you get back. So that's why it's occurred to me that taking some time to write again, um, which I have, which I used to, which used to be a, a a way in which I could be with God uh, is something that I think I need to try to do, and it scares me to death. Now, I do, um, I do try to say the daily office every day, and that is a huge help to me. I'm very grateful to the way in which our own tradition, in imitation of Judaism, seeks to sanctify time uh, and I, I find I find the, uh, the discipline of morning prayer whether I'm saying it by myself at home or whether with my staff at work is just a salvation and uh, and I really can't say that there's anything else that I do thank you I didn't mean to put you on the spot I'll tell you I think that there's nothing I mean I just think that is brilliant that you're going to go write poetry <laughs> because poetry to me is just the classic being present I mean if you were going to go write a book about something um, <laughs> you know I'd be worried <laughs> and of course that Sabbath has got to be a joke in academics and it's true with clergy too people call this Sabbath when they do go off to write some articles and write a book and everything like that and um, it sounds like nothing, nothing's more contemplative than, being, than writing poetry I mean, really. And I hope you have a beautiful question too, or something. <laughs> Good. Mendel C. Oh, great. Oh, great. <coughs> More comments, questions, challenges. One thing that I find that I really need to work on is what Chris was talking about, about attentiveness and, and noticing things. I'm notoriously unobservant. And I heard this wonderful, apparently I'm not the only one, I heard this wonderful interview on NPR with a man who um, 
is a paraplegic who has these incredibly tricked out prosthetic limbs. He's a rock climber, so he, he climbs rocks with his limbs. And what's amazing about them is that, and they're, you know, titanium, I don't know what, but they can expand or contract so that he can determine that depending on what the next hole is for rock climbing, how long he wants his, his prosthetic limbs to be. But he decided that he would, he would experiment with this in ordinary life and make himself taller or shorter, just as a joke. <laughs> and he, he lifted it up a little bit more every day, and nobody noticed until he was over seven feet tall. <laughs> That's a really funny story, but it, it, it really brings two things together in my mind that, that suddenly have come together. When we talked about Sabbath as a time when you know, do you gather with your family and um, have a meal and engage, engage with other people, um, or do you go off and take a walk in the woods by yourself because what you most need is solitude and quiet and so on. But um, paying attention is what you're doing in both of those situations. You know, if you're eating a meal, you're really eating it, tasting it, noticing what you're eating. If you're with people you love, you're attentive. If you're doing a walk in the woods, you see. And that gives you the time set apart. Um, I, I want to uh, do a, a witness to the power of this uh, series, much like Ariel did. Um, man, this microphone is a lot. Um, uh, our vestry went away and board chairs on a retreat, what, about three weeks ago? And, and uh, ever since I've been the rector here, uh, we have had, coming out of our vestry retreat, board chair retreat, uh, a set of goals uh, arising from the vision that we own as a parish leadership. And that's served us very well. And we've been ambitious with those goals, and we've uh, accomplished some, we hope we've accomplished some, some big, big stuff, particularly recently. And uh, the vestry, very much against their rector's wishes, decided to take a Sabbath year from goals. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, I make up the agenda uh, every month for the vestry meeting. And on there, there's usually the, we approve the minutes, of course, after a half an hour Bible study or spiritual sharing. And then we have the three vestry goals for the year, parish goals. And then we talk about those. And then if there's any time left over, before 9 o'clock, we talk about other things. This year, we're going to have a question as our agenda. Where have you experienced deeper engagement with Christ in, um, in our community? That's it. I am so anxious, Chris. <laughs> I really am. Because I, it, it feels to me like the same way the bishop explained uh, what it feels like to do poetry. It's absolutely threatening uh, because I, I think by saying that and by being faithful to that Sabbath intuition, which I think, by the way, is right for our parish right now, um, we are risking a living God. And I don't know where that's going to go. That's, a, that's the nature of life, wasn't it? The, I mean, God, God, God risked in engaging with us, uh, did not consider it something to be grasped, but came down in the flesh, the incarnation. Um, and, and it's always there. I mean, Sabbath, Sabbath is a risk. I mean, we don't know what we'll find when we're present with ourselves or present with with someone else, it may be it may be really ugly. It may be beautiful. Um, I mean, eventually, hopefully, beauty will come out of some of the ugliness that we find. But um, but yeah, it, it's always a risk. I think that's I really appreciate your you naming that.
We've talked about poetry. Can I read one poem? <laughs> this has been really, this is not my poem, so uh, I can uh, not indulge myself here, but this is a poem that's been really important for me. Uh, kind of the question that Nancy asked the bishop of what sort of Sabbath practices have been important for you. One, of, one that's been important for me is what I call, for lack of a better term, urban naturalism. Um, I live in a very urban neighborhood, lots of concrete, lots of pavement, huge parking lot behind my house, um, huge industrial complex across the street uh, that's slowly being torn down, uh, not been in use for 20 years or more. Um, but, but I believe, I mean, for some of the reasons that uh, I took, that came up in the in talking about the art of Antonio Lucas Garcia. Um, I mean, I really believe that there are wonders to be found um, in in that neighborhood, in, in the place that a lot of people would consider to be a pretty dull, gray, uh, uninteresting urban place. But but as I have experimented with this off and on over the last couple of years, I've really been encouraged by the poetry of the agrarian writer, um, Liberty High Bailey, um, who was uh, uh, was probably the preeminent, preeminent botanist and horticulturalist in the early 20th century. Um, but he also did a significant amount of nature and agrarian writings, um, a very much an influence on Wendell Berry. Uh, Wendell Berry um, has an essay called a Particular Harmony in the book What Are People For? And most of that uh, essay is a tribute to the work of uh, Liberty High Bailey. But, um, but there's this one poem that, um, that I just want a really short poem. Um, I think it gets to the heart of what Sabbath is about and, and, and why poetry is so important. This is a, this is a poem about poetry. Um, it's called Poet. Tell me, O poet, where thou dost live. Show me the place whereon thou dost stand. Lead me to the crests that give those wondrous scenes thou dost command. And let my waiting soul and breathe the rare airs thou dost breathe upon thy diamond shore. He took me by the hand and led me to my own hearthstone. We paused upon the wanted floor and silent stood alone till all the space was overpent with a magic wonderment. And I found the poet's store on the threshold of my door. It's that magic wonderment that that Sabbath is about. It's the gift, I appreciate it, the several times that it's been talked about, it's a gift that we, we receive and we learn gratitude by learning to, to receive that and to, uh, to be shaped and formed by it. Thank you, Chris. You know, it's, uh, before Chris read the poem, there was this long period of silence. And it reminded me of what happened in my sermon in the banquet last Sunday. <laughs> Where I stepped out into the middle uh, of the congregation and said, what is the quietest moment in a church service? And there was this long, long silence until Annie Grainer, how old is Annie? Nine years old, said, when, when, the, when the preacher asks a question. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I was, before she spoke, I was getting anxious. But, you know, that's what the patience is, is allowing the silence, which then allows possibilities to happen. And uh, thank you for the poem that came out of that silence. Um, I think it might be appropriate at this time, uh, Bishop, if I could surprise you and ask you to send us off with a prayer or a blessing. Sure. We, let's stand up. <coughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. In Jesus' name.
Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Please join me again in giving thanks to all. I just wanted to announce that Betsy Schramm is here with some books. Um, but there's one in particular that I don't